So I'll be talking about hereditary breast and colorectal cancers today. So the learning outcomes for this lecture, by the end of this lecture, you should have an idea of the genetic basis of hereditary breast and colorectal cancer and describe the criteria for referral of these patients for genetic evaluation of their cancer risk and have an idea of the current uh, cancer genetic diagnostic methods as well as the available targeted therapeutic modalities which are now currently being used for breast and colorectal cancer. So we all know that every cancer is due to genetic variations, but not all cancers are inherited. Breast cancers or any cancer can be broadly classified into three main categories. You have the majority of cancers being sporadic, accounting for about 70 to 80%. And then we have the familial group, which accounts for about 20 to 30%. And the hereditary group, which is the inherited group, which accounts for about five to 10% of all cancers. So if we go back to the basics of uh, cell cycle and uh, cell division and mitosis, if you remember the cell cycle, uh, there are different stages uh, during the process of uh, cell division. And this process is uh, tightly controlled by genes. Okay, so there are different uh, checkpoints in the cell cycle. There are different uh, checkpoints in the cell cycle, which uh, maintain uh, a normal coordinated uh, fashion of cell division. So some of these um, genes are gatekeepers, others are known as caretakers. So if you look at the gatekeepers, we have these proto-oncogenes like KRAS, BRAF, Mike, which uh, when um, their main pur purpose is to promote cell division and growth. Then we have the tumor suppressor genes like APC, uh, TP53 and so on, which are referred to as gatekeepers also. And they inhibit the cell cycle and promote apoptosis. And then we have these other group of uh, genes, which are the caretakers, the DNA mismatch repair genes. And what they basically do is they uh, correct uh, mismatch errors during the replication process. So you can see that this whole process of cell division is tightly regulated by these genes which uh, act at different checkpoints. So if there are mutations in these um, important genes, it can affect the cell cycle and cell division process and sometimes can lead to uncontrolled cell division and proliferation which will result in a cancer. So most of the time if the proto-oncogenes uh, are mutated, they will become oncogenes and then um, what will happen is uh, there's uncontrolled cell proliferation. And if there are tumor suppressor genes are mutated, they lose their function. So they fail to suppress the cell cycle. So there's uncontrolled replication. And also if the mismatch repair genes are mutated, what will happen is that there will be a lot of errors accumulating during the process of DNA replication. And that can also lead to uh, disastrous consequences. So I talked about the three main types of uh, cancers. We have the sporadic type, the familial type, and the hereditary type. So if you look at this family tree, which is also known as the pedigree, you can see that there are three generations here, and there's only one affected individual. So this is what you typically see in a sporadic cancer. You have just one individual, and usually the uh, age of onset of these cancers are very late, maybe in the 60s, 70s, and so on and there is no other individual in uh, several generations of that uh, pedigree. If you look at the familial cancer, you can see here that there's a clustering of cancers in a particular generation, but there is no clear cut pattern of inheritance. You just see this cluster here. And usually this is attributed to both um, the effects of multiple genes as well as environmental factors like uh, shared lifestyle factors or uh, and exposure to environmental carcinogens and so on, which could be uh, the cause of these cancers clustering in a particular family. Then the final pedigree is the one that you typically see for a inherited or hereditary cancer. So you can see there are several generations with multiple affected individuals. And usually you have an affected parent and uh, children could be affected. There's usually the autosomal dominant pattern of transmission for most of these hereditary cancers. Of course, there are autosomal recessively inherited cancers also, but uh, most of the time it follows the autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. So if we go into hereditary breast cancer itself, 
It is usually caused by germline pathogenic variants in cancer susceptibility genes, which are also known as cancer predisposing genes. And these variants can be broadly classified into three categories. So you have rare variants in the high penetrant genes, which normally increase your risk of uh, developing a cancer by more than tenfold. Then we have these rare variants in the moderate penetrant genes, which increase the cancer risk by two to five fold. And you have these common variants in the low penetrant genes, which are commonly found in most uh, uh, individuals in the society. And this might sort of cause uh, an increase by one to two fold, but that is not enough to uh, bring about the cancer. So, so many other factors have to come into play. Now, if we look at uh, hereditary breast cancer, germline variants in the high penetrant genes like BRCA1 and 2, I'm sure you must have heard about those uh, common genes. They account for the majority of her hereditary breast cancers, so almost 15 to 40% are due to those two genes. Now, this list shows the breast cancer predisposition genes, which have been uh, commonly identified. So you have on the top of the list BRCA1 and 2. These are tumor suppressor genes, so when they are mutated, they fail to suppress the cell cycle, and uh, there's loss of apoptosis resulting in uncontrolled cell proliferation. So the normal uh, features are you have breast and ovarian cancer, but there are other tumor phenotypes which you can have in these individuals. Another common gene is the TP53, which is associated with leaf romani syndrome, and here patients could have uh, a variety of tumors like breast cancer, sarcomas, leukemias, adrenal cortical tumors, brain tumors, and so on. And it's, um, it has very high penetrance, so almost 90% of individuals who have pathogenic variants in this gene will end up developing a tumor in their lifetime. The other one is the P10, which is associated with Cowden syndrome. Cowden, of course, can cause breast cancers, thyroid cancers, hematomas, and so on. CDH1 causes uh, familial diffuse gastric cancer. That is, you have both breast cancer and gastric cancer occurring at the same time. STK11 is another uh, gene that has been implicated in Pugh-Jagger syndrome. It causes hematomatous polyps, causing colorectal cancer and also breast cancers. And PALB2 has also been now classified as a high penetrant gene, and it's been associated with breast pancreatic and prostate cancers. So if we come to the moderate penetrant genes, we have common ones like CHEK2, BRIP1, and ATM. And as I mentioned, most of these moderate penetrant gene variants increase the risk of cancer by about two to five fold, whereas the other ones have a higher risk. So the common ones are the BRCA1 and 2. So if you look at the pathogenic variants uh, in these genes, carriers of pathogenic variants in these two genes, what is their estimated lifetime risk of developing cancers? So if we take uh, up to the age of 70, for both uh, these genes, if there are pathogenic variants, there's almost 60 to 85% of uh, chance of developing a breast tumor. For ovarian cancer, it's uh, more with the BRCA1, so if almost 40 to 60% increased risk of having an ovarian cancer by that age. Then looking at male breast cancer, prostate, pancreatic melanomas, both can cause those, but uh, more implicated is the BRCA2 gene variants for these cancers. So this is a typical uh, pedigree that you would see in a family that has this hereditary breast cancer running through the generations. And in this case, they have identified the gene uh, to be the BRCA2 gene uh, variant. So you have one, two, three, four generations and you have uh, multiple individuals affected. But I would like to draw your attention to this individual who has been uh, found to have the uh, pathogenic variant when, when his blood was her blood was tested, but apparently she has not yet manifested the cancer, but she has passed on the pathogenic variant to her son and down the line like that. So this might be due to non-penetrance or reduced penetrance of the variant in this uh, lady. So that can happen. You can have sort of a skip generation and then the next generation they have uh, tumors manifesting. So important for you to know the criteria for referral for genetic evaluation. So genetic evaluation basically would involve uh, counseling pre and post test and also the genetic testing component. So how do you identify a patient that needs to be referred for genetic evaluation? Usually these patients will have a positive family history, like uh, there will be several members with the same type of cancer running across multiple generations, either first, second or third degree. 
and usually it could be the maternal side or paternal side so it's not only restricted to the maternal side it could come down from the paternal side also or it could be several members of the same side of the family with cancers which are part of a non hereditary cancer syndrome like the H uh, BOC, which is hereditary breast ovarian cancer syndrome, where you have some individuals with breast and ovarian cancers, or Lifromani, where you have individuals with sarcomas, breast tumors, and then you have leukemias and so on. Or the typical Lynch syndrome, where you have colorectal cancers alongside breast cancer. So any of these combinations should raise your index of suspicion that probably this is a, there's an underlying genetic cause. Other features of these cancers, the hereditary cancers, include early age of onset, usually less than 50 years. Uh, normally bilateral primary tumors in paired organs like uh, breast or ovary and so on. And of course, uh, multiple primary tumors in one individual. So you can have a breast tumor and ovarian tumor like that. Rare cancers like male breast cancer should uh, raise your index of suspicion and also multifocal tumors within a single organ and triple negative breast cancer, especially in the premenopausal stage. So these are um, criteria that you should you know, consider. So what happens in genetic counseling? Um, all patients who undergo genetic testing are offered pre and post test counseling. And this is important because this counseling allows individuals to learn how hereditary contributes to their cancer risk and understand their personal risk of developing cancer. It also helps them to manage their cancer risk and ad, um, encourage adoption of risk reducing behaviors that are appropriate for them. So there are two stages. We have the pre-test counseling and then the post-test counseling. In the pre-test counseling, a discussion of the personal risk of cancer based on the family history is done and possible outcomes of genetic testing, including the benefits, risk limitations are discussed with the patient. And of course, the uh, informed consent is obtained prior to testing. Post-test counseling generally involves a discussion of the results of the genetic test and their significance. And of course, the medical management will be reviewed based on the genetic report, including screening and treatment options. So what are the genetic testing uh, methods that are available? There are two main methods. You have the germline and the somatic variant testing. So what is meant by germline and uh, somatic? We'll look at that. Nowadays, we have these high throughput next generation sequencing facilities that enable us to look at the patient's germline genome, that is the blood or the tumor tissue and look at the tumor genome. So if we look at the germline inherited genetic variants, these are the variants that predispose an individual to increase cancer risk. So we are looking for variants in cancer predisposing genes in the DNA, in the peripheral blood. If we want to look at the somatic the acquired genetic variants, which are associated with um, uncontrolled replication of cells, tumor adva growth advantage, and so on. We need to look at the tumor tissue and identify what are the somatic variants or the acquired genetic variants that are driving this tumor. So DNA in the tumor tissue is tested in such uh, situations. So I told you the methods. Uh, we have the NGS methods now. Exome sequencing, that is you're looking at all the protein coding regions of the genome, or you can have the cancer gene panels uh, being utilized where you have panels of uh, all the identified cancer predisposing genes. And these could be used to simultaneously analyze multiple cancer predisposing genes to identify where the genetic mutation is and uh, that is causing increased risk of cancer for this family. So in germline, we are looking at the blood and in the tissue, that is the tumor tissue, we are looking at the somatic variants. And here also we can utilize exome sequencing or cancer panel testing to identify the driver mutations which are uh, causing the tumor. Then in addition to that, we have the gene expression profiles and genetic signatures which are found in tumor tissue. So there are tests that have been developed that can identify these uh, expression profiles in the tissue. And they have very important information, like they provide information about the prognosis and uh, uh, they give predictive information on response to certain treatments. So for breast cancer, we have uh, tests like the MAMA print and Oncotype DX, which will help the clinician to decide what type of uh, therapy to give, whether to uh, combine um, hormone receptor antagonist with um, chemotherapy and whether there's a risk of uh, recurrence and relapse of the cancer. So these are all uh, helpful for the clinician. And of course, you have the pharmacogenomic tests like HER2 
uh, amplification because you know one third of breast cancers are having her to amplify amplification and there are drugs which have now been developed to block this receptor so things like herceptin these uh, all these tests are now very helpful in the management of uh, patients with breast cancer so if you are interested in learning more about the testing criteria for hereditary cancer, you can refer to this uh, guideline, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines. It's being up updated uh, frequently and it's uh, freely available to all clinicians once you register. So I would advise you to visit this site and uh, go through the materials that are available. So looking at the breast uh, cancer treatment options, I told you that apart from the conventional treatment, now we have the targeted treatments, uh, the small molecules which have been developed, because now we know the pathways that are involved, especially the receptors, the EGFR receptors, the HER2 receptors. And of course, these are like uh, transmembrane receptors, which have a ligand binding portion and an intracellular tyrosine kinase domain. So these are receptor tyrosine kinases and small molecules have been developed to block these targets because once these um, receptors are activated, they cause downstream activation of other pathways, uh, signaling pathways like PI3K, AKT, mTOR pathway, RAS, MAPK, and they all cause um, cell cycle progression, division of cells, uh, angiogenesis, loss of apoptosis or proliferation and so on, uncontrolled proliferation. So drugs have now been developed to target these uh, cellular pathways and by blocking these pathways, you can sort of uh, limit the degree of cell proliferation and halt the tumor. So for breast cancer, I will just mention the common ones that are available. For hormone receptor positive breast cancer, that's the estrogen and the progesterone receptors. Uh, those can be blocked using uh, drugs such as the uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators, tamoxifen, raloxifen, and so on. These are mainly for the premenopausal breast cancers. And for the postmenopausal, you have the aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole. Then for the HER2 amplified breast cancer, I told you about Herceptin, which is an inhibitor for that receptor, transetuzumab. And then you have a newer generation of drugs like uh, lapatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and so on. Then the PI3 AKT mTOR uh, pathway is uh, activated in breast cancer and now drugs have been developed to block that pathway, inhibitors like everolimus. And of course, one of the newer introductions is PARP inhibitors, which are base excision repair inhibitors that have been found to be useful in patients who have BRCA1 and 2 uh, pathogenic variants. So what do you do when you have a patient who has a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic uh, mutation in either BRCA1 and 2? Of course, uh, they need to be followed up closely and there are clinical guidelines we refer to and this is the NCCN guidelines and there are for different uh, tumor types. So for breast cancer, you have this uh, guideline here, which I have just uh, given a screenshot. So like it will tell you at what age to start screening, how often to screen these patients, what type of follow-up. Is it ultrasound? Is it mammography? Is it uh, MRI? You know, so all that information is given in these guidelines, and these are the guidelines that we normally follow. So coming to the second part of my presentation, uh, I'll be talking briefly about hereditary colorectal cancers. And as usual, there are three broad categories. You have the sporadic majority group, the familial group, and the uh, typical hereditary or the inherited group. And here we have two major types here. You have the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, also known as Lynch syndrome, uh, which accounts for about 5%. And these are due to mutations or pathogenic variants in the DNA mismatch repair genes, which we looked at in the cell cycle. So if these genes are mutated, they will cause problems for that patient. And those are the genes which have been implicated in this syndrome and of course we have the polyps that is the familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome due to mutations in the apc gene and we saw that apc is a tumor suppressor gene so if that is mutated of course it's going to cause um, uncontrolled cell proliferation in the tissues and predispose to cancer so Classifying the colorectal cancers, we have the polyposis uh, syndromes, hereditary polyposis colon cancer. The top one there is the FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis. Then you have Pugega, uh, also known as PJS, juvenile polyposis, and the MUTY associated or the MYH associated polyposis. Then coming to the non polyposis, you have the Lynch syndrome, hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer. So that is. Uh, second category. And if we look at uh, 
the different syndromes that have been identified so far have shown them in this table. So you have the syndromes and the tumor phenotypes and the genes which are implicated. Most of them are autosomal dominantly inherited, but MYH is autosomal recessively inherited. So that's due to mutations in the MYH. Now, if we look at FAP, these individuals have multiple numerous adenomas, more than 100, and there are the uh, polyps in other regions of the GI tract. And there are variants of FAP like Gardner syndrome, which uh, in addition to colorectal cancer, they have desmoid tumors and in Turcot syndrome, in addition to the polyps, uh, they have brain tumors like medulloblastomas and so on. Then there's the attenuated variety of FAP in which you have less than 100 polyps uh, in contrast to the classical FAP where you have numerous polyps. And this is due to mutations in the APC gene. Then the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, here we have the DNA mismatch repair gene mutations, and they have um, a variety of tumors that can develop. Apart from colorectal cancer, you can have endometrial, ovarian, gastric, urothelial, hepatobiliary, brain, and so on. Fugega, important, STK11. Most of these patients have this classical mucocutaneous pigmentation. We can, you can easily pick up in the clinic, and they have a lot of hamatomatous polyps, which can develop into tumors and then uh, juvenile polyposis and so on. So what is the lifetime risk of developing uh, cancers in an individual who, have, who has mutations in the mismatch repair genes uh, in HNPCC? Of course, the top one there is colorectal cancer, 70 to 80%. Endometrial is next, 20 to 60%. Then they can have gastric cancers, hepatobiliary, urinary, ovarian, and so on. So all these, uh, the lifetime risk of having any of these cancers is increased in these individuals. What are the criteria for referral for genetic evaluation? Of course, these are the NCCN guidelines which have extracted, so you can refer to them later on. So if you have an affected individual suspected to be having HNPCC or an at-risk family member, what are the criteria you have to look at? So probably a first degree relative with uh, HNPCC related cancer, age of onset less than 50 years or two HNPC related cancers in one individual. So you can have endometrial and a colorectal or the number of polyps being greater than 10 and the age of onset of endometrial less than 10. So if you find these markers or criteria in your patients, you should have a high index of suspicion that this is probably an HNPCC uh, condition going on in the family. And here also I've given um, extracts of the American College of Gastroenterologist clinical guidelines for management of Lynch syndrome. So of course we have the surgical resection of the tumors, which colectomy and then hysterectomy because there's high risk of endometrial cancers, ovarian cancers, and also aspirin has been found to be useful lately. And then how do you screen and follow up? Okay, guidelines for following up an individual who is at risk. So probably he has not yet developed the tumor, but he has the pathogenic variant and uh, all the patient who has been affected and undergone surgery, how do you follow them up? What are the investigations you need to do? So all that is listed in the guidelines. At what age do you do the colonoscopies? How often do you do it? So one to two years. What, uh, and also for transvaginal ultrasound for endometrial cancers and so on. So those guidelines you can always refer to later on. So what are the targeted therapies that are available in uh, colorectal cancers? There are drugs uh, that have been developed, especially for the metastatic colon cancer, the advanced stages. Just like in breast cancer, where you had HER2 amplification in uh, colon cancer, you have EGFR overexpression in almost 90% of colorectal cancers. And they have developed anti-EGFR therapies. So there are monoclonal antibodies which bind to that receptor and inhibit it. So this is approved for treating metastatic colorectal cancer. And KRAS gene is... Um, uh, important because if there are mutations in these genes, it will predict whether the drug is going to work or not, and I will explain why. So anti-EGFR treatment resistance can be predicted by looking at KRAS gene mutations. If there are no mutations in the KRAS gene, of course, the patient can go ahead and benefit from the anti-EGFR therapy. The reason being that if you look at this cell, so the receptor, so this is the EGFR receptor. So when the ligand binds there, the EGF, it activates it and then it sends signals to KRAS. And then, because this is the NRAS or the KRAS pathway. And then this sends growth commands to the cell to divide and replicate. 
So if we block this receptor using a monoclonal antibody like the EGF anti-EGF receptor blockers that have been developed, you prevent these signals passing downstream. So you stop the replication of the cells okay, and block uh, the signal growth from passing downwards. But in cases where the, uh, the KRAS gene is mutated, it acts independent of the EGFR signal. So even if you block this receptor, it has no effect on this um, KRAS gene because it, it's uh, working autonomously and uh, sends growth signals causing uncontrolled cell replication. So patients who have uh, mutation in the KRAS gene will not benefit from anti-EGFR therapy. So that's why this pharmacogenomic test is normally done for colorectal cancer patients before starting anti-EGFR therapy, because otherwise it will be a waste. So on a final note, uh, integrating genomics into the personalized care of hereditary cancer, very important because it will help to uh, detect individuals who are at risk with a care hereditary cancer predisposition at a very early stage. So if there's a family history, once the uh, mutation in the family is uh, detected, the other individuals can be screened. So normally we start with an affected individual in the family, uh, look for the mutation, the germline mutation, and then the pre-symptomatic or the asymptomatic individuals in the family, the other members can be screened to see if that mutation is there in them also, whether they have inherited it. Then it's also useful for prognostication of the tumors because uh, I told you about several markers that can be used now for typing subtyping these tumors molecularly and that has a lot of information in terms of prognosis and prediction of therapy. So guiding treatment decisions, especially prediction of response to specific therapies like in the KRAS situation. Okay, so these are all uh, important for institution of tailored treatment based on the patient's germline and tumor genomic profile. So basically we are dealing with precision medicine. That's how genomics is uh, playing a big role in the management of cancer. So the paradigm that is new in terms of cancer treatment and management is, of course, traditionally we have the patient, the biopsy being done, and then the histopathological diagnosis made. But now in addition to that, we have the genomic profile, the genomic landscape, identified the pathways, identified which genes are mutated, which pathways are activated, and then you can select the appropriate targeted drugs to block these pathways and halt or slow down the progression of the tumor. And in terms of monitoring response to treatment, and of course, uh, initial, previously they used to do repeat biopsies, but now we can um, detect circulating tumor cells or tumor DNA in the peripheral blood. So that is a way of monitoring the patient's response to treatment to see if there's resistance to treatment or if there's a relapse of the cancer. So these are all new um, modalities. Okay, so that's uh, all I have for that. Then there's a small case scenario, which I'll just uh, show you here, which I think will be discussed during the case-based discussion. So this is a lady who is 29 years old with a family history of breast cancer early onset um, invasive breast cancer, triple negative with three first degree relatives. So this lady has her mother and two other relatives and uh, she wants to know whether she's genetically predisposed. Okay, so what will be the approach to this kind of a patient? And if she's found to have a genetic mutation in a BRCA2 gene, what will be the next step? So those are things that will be discussed. And these are some resources I would like to refer you to. You can visit them at your leisure time and uh, learn more about these guidelines. So thank you.